So good morning and welcome. Thank you for coming out on this great Friday. I'm Julia Bryan Wilson, Professor of Art History and the Director of the Arts Research Center, which is an interdisciplinary think tank for the arts here at UC Berkeley. Today's event, Amateurism Across the Arts, is the first academic conference of its kind, an investigation that brings together talks on visual art, architecture, music, literature, new media, and fashion from scholars whose own work has been marked by persistent engagement with what we could call unofficial cultural practices in the 20th and 21st centuries. Within our sessions and performances today, we will explore vernacular, popular, fanish, kitsch, informal, self-taught, user-generated, and do-it-yourself production, across and between disciplinary formations of artistic making, especially in relation to race, class, and gender notions of value. So I'm going to offer some introductory remarks, um, and then we will turn things over to a performance. And I want to note that the words that I just used, this kind of litany of um, related terms, including DIY, vernacular, kitsch, are of course not synonyms. And as the day unfolds, I hope our terminology will become more precise and located in specific temporal and regional contexts. However, what clusters many of these terms together is the idea that they are motors of cultural making from below, that are distinct in some way from the register of fine art. And of course, the definition of fine art itself is contingent, but historically in the West, since the Renaissance, art in many disciplines has been distinguished by its relationship to skill, and bounded by rather policed institutions, both material and ideologically, ideological, that produce their own established criteria around expertise, education, and training. Today, we will grapple with and take seriously cultural works by people whose aesthetic sensibilities might not have been formed in these institutions including those who did not pursue traditional arts education in academies or through established circuits that meant prestige. Within my own discipline of art history, it is implicitly acknowledged that visual culture might come from many quarters, including from folks or outsiders, um, which are imposed identifications, that because they can be so much about educational access, cleave strongly along structures of nation, class, race, and gender. And of course, every discipline has their own distinct genealogies in terms of how these terms get mobilized. But broadly speaking, if the arts are understood to be implicitly skilled or produced from exclusive educational systems that cultivate and indeed regulate the class category of taste, a more robust and considered conversation around amateurism has the potential to rupture and reorganize the hierarchies of good taste versus bad taste that inevitably shadow conversations about art. I'm especially interested in how critical race, feminist, and queer scholarship can account differently for hobbyist, that is, extra-institutional, self-organized, or improvised, modes of cultural production and circulation. Amateur art is frequently defiantly unprofessional, that is, unpaid, an act of sensual labor that is propelled for reasons other than remuneration. It can be punk. Understanding itself as contributing to an oppositional or anti-corporate culture. It can be queer or outlaw or marginal in a way that refuses to be assimilated. But it can also be popular or commercial, gleefully partaking of and participating in the flows of mass culture. In my own recently published book on textiles in the Americas from the 1970s to the 1990s, I consider how amateurism is understood as framed by an intended audience. So a quilt made by someone who does not consider herself an artist and does not intend for that quilt to live outside the confines of her own bedroom might be considered amateur. But for me, that definition is always classic and noble. Within the realm of textiles, as with many other cultural forms, the designation of amateur is not neutral. Amateurism persistently cleaves to the female maker, the non-white maker, the non-Western maker, the non-educated. And hence in Prey, my, uh, which is my recent book, my terminology also importantly does not hinge on education. Because for me, someone who has been diligently and carefully taught to, to sew by her mother does not truly count as untrained or self-taught. And today I hope we can investigate further how these phrases have been in the 20th and 21st century activated in different directions, especially in conversation with so-called advanced artistic practices. For if amateurism has traditionally been disavowed in modernist and avant-garde historiographies, it is at the same time persistently or even obsessively invoked. 
and is hence inextricably woven into those rhetorics. The classic text on this subject in my field is Clement Greenberg's 1939 essay, Olive Garden Hitch. I cannot believe I'm writing about this. <laughs> <laughs> I have to come back to this. This morning as I was writing, writing these poems, I was like, I, can't, I have to come back to Greenberg. Um, and it has, I will say, it's been set ablaze innumerable times um, as the kind of perfunctory straw man who is there to be immolated in order to clear the field for a more complex discussion. And I don't want to oversimplify what is a very, what has been a very generative argument, actually, for many, many decades. Um, so yes, on the one hand, Greenberg sets up a dichotomy, um, hitting avant-garde culture against what he calls a rear guard of crass, commercial, debased, kitschified art. Those are all his terms, not my words. But he also does acknowledge how imbricated those formations are with each other, how mutually interdependent. So while Greenberg does show contempt for the Hollywood movies and Tin Pan Alley songs that are for him mechanical and formulaic, again, those are his words, his essay also deeply pivots on class and his exasperation with what he believes is an ever-consolidating, increasingly monolithic corporate culture that seeks profit above all. And I have my sympathies with that. I do have some sympathies with that argument. And so though I do um, take issue with much of what Greenberg says, especially his assertion that the low is a dilution or a debasement of the high, or that popular culture vampirically feeds off of advanced culture, I don't think it's uh, really directional like that. But I do find myself coming back to this essay because for Greenberg, the positions of avant-garde and Fitch have the potential to be dynamic rather than static, maneuvering themselves in relation to their constant contact. Rather than rearguard many avant-garde artistic movements in the last century, particularly those who wanted to upend class-based hierarchies, have sought explicitly to refresh themselves by enlisting non-professionals. And I'm thinking here of amateur theater in the 1920s and 30s, just after the Russian Revolution, in which productions, the, the productions most lauded for being vanguard, were written, performed, directed, and costumed entirely by non-writers, non-actors, non-directors, and non-designers. Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown's Learning from Las Vegas is another significant milestone in the history of US formations of amateurism within the academy with its attention paid to vernacular architecture that was both exceptional but could also be, in their words, ugly and ordinary. And I will say that the publication of that book, which was in 1972, was, um, I mean, the book itself has many things that are interesting, but even more interesting is the fact that it was such a bestseller, that it was such a milestone in the literature on vernacular architecture, and I think right at the moment of the emergence of what we now call postmodernism, and I think that sometimes this, an, an interest in amateur production happens around these reorganizations in, um, uh, or realignments in um, capitalism that have a kind of cultural outcome, like modernism and <clears throat> and I point to Russian revolutionary theater with its bracingly modernist forms and abstract stage sets made entirely by amateurs, and to learning from Las Vegas um, as just a few signature moments in which culture from above and culture from below were understood as pressured categories that had political stakes. Indeed, today's symposium asks how the high and the low are porous constructions by looking at the ways that these charged terms have been deployed and dismantled across several artistic disciplines, particularly as we examine the alternative economies and systems of distribution that attend such forms of making. How has amateurism been both implicated in consumerism but also a fertile site of possible resistance to those me methods of circulation? Within contemporary art, it has become commonplace for so-called fine artists to recruit untrained participants into their practices sometimes forcing striking confrontations about class privilege and power differentials, sometimes absolutely repressing or alighting these issues altogether in what wants to be a celebratory parade of janitors or police officers or disabled persons on stage. There's quite a lot of um, this work happening, especially in dance and theater. A recent issue of the Contemporary Theater Review has called this the amateur turn and raises questions about the affect of labor performed, often for little or no compensation, when non-professional actors or dancers or musicians perform their own sincere efforting in front of largely elite audiences. In distinction to this trend, it is vital to acknowledge that many non-professional forms of making grow out of necessity and survival. 
people find a way to write and publish poetry in the wake of the 2008 financial collapse, for instance, or build houses in Brazil in a modernist idiom out of the materials at hand. And those last two examples are a little glimpse forward to some of the talks that we heard today. Though amateur is frequently used as a shorthand for the unpracticed, the dilettantish, or the uninteresting, this conference seeks to understand its connections to its Latin root word, amare, a complex outgrowth of critical investment, pleasure, and love. This love is often rushed and urgent, desperate to express itself and unafraid of clumsiness or rough edges. Its vitality lies precisely in its lack of polish. Just as amateur invokes many synonyms and conjures a whole constellation of related words like hobbyist or low, or for some regressive, so too does it have many antonyms, including the skilled, the expert, the virtuosic. One of the most persistent false binaries not only sets the amateur against a Greenbergian vanguard, but also insists that amateurism is opposed to mastery. As Julietta Singh's recent book, Unthinking Mastery, reminds us, Mastery has been a driving framework of colonial regimes that insist upon the domination of subjects perceived to be lesser than. She concludes her book with the notion that we must rethink how we narrate mastery, including who and what gets to be masterful, and move beyond the academic thirst for control and the conquest of knowledge, as instead we cultivate discomfort by acknowledging that all that we do not know and we may never know. It is a call, I think, for approaching the world not with the intent to possess it with ever-refining regimes of mastery, but to embrace it with the fervent awkwardness of an amateur. So before I conclude my remarks, I need to perform the ritualistic <coughs> invocation of gratitude, which is to thank our sponsors and the people that made today happen. And this is not a hollow gesture by any means but an acknowledgement of the many entities on campus that have supported this occasion and have worked very hard to pull it off. So first of all, thanks, so many thanks to my associate director, Lauren Pearson, who makes everything happen and makes my job so easy, so amazing. <laughs> It is thematically appropriate that the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology has agreed graciously to host us, not only because anthropology is another discipline that has long considered amateur making, um, both Western and non-Western, as part of its proper object of inquiry, but also because this current show was curated entirely by a team of working undergraduates and seeks to empower all of us, regardless of education, to consider ourselves anthropologists. It's also the perfect venue for today because as you can see, there are many spaces, informal and formal, to talk and continue our conversation with all of these spaces from across many cultures. Uh, and in the interstitial moments of the conference, I hope you take the opportunity to look around at some of these incredible things on display. Moje Potts, one of my favorite things ever, right there. <laughs> uh, right at our fingertips. I consider these many, and the theme of this show that, as I said, was curated by undergrads, is about faces. And I consider the many heads around us de facto participants from many different times and spaces, staring back and rendering their silent but hopefully benevolent judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Other co-sponsors include the Division of Arts and Humanities, the Global Urban Humanities Initiative, the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Stoddard Lecture Series in the History of Art Department, the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the Townsend Center for the Humanities, and Judith Butler, who contributed some of her Maxine Elliott Endowed Share Funds. Um, I will be introducing the speakers as well as the respondents before each panel, and there, those will be brief introductions since more information is found in the program. And I don't want to take away um, time from the talks. You will note that in each panel there is ample time for questions from the audience, and that is very intentional. I hope that when you ask questions, you will introduce yourselves, not be kind of... Um, you know, anonymous beings out there, but uh, state who you are because I want to insist that we are all experts in amateurism. <laughs> and though we have many different artistic fields represented here, I hope we can all bring these subjects, um, bring to these subjects something of our own inquiries. The day will also be punctuated by undergraduate student performances drawn from the many entirely self-organized activities 
who's embodied engagements with artistic production, including self-taught music groups, hip-hop dance teams, consisting entirely of students who have never had experience in dance, and a do-it-yourself fashion show. And this is a way of putting theories of amateurism into vivid practice right here in this space. In other words, I think of these performances as really part of the critical work of the conference, and, I, uh, and they have, I've been understanding them as a kind of parallel conversation. Lastly, I want to mention that there are still slots available for the tour of the Albany Bulb tomorrow, which is a former landfill that has become an anarchic public space, teeming with guerrilla inst installations and amateur visual art environments. Um, I will hold up a piece of paper. Please sign up online. You can't just sort of show up and think that um, you'll be able to participate because it's a little bit more organized than that. Um, so you can sign up. There are links on the back. This is going to be led by Susan Moffat, who is the program director of the Global, Global Urban Humanities Initiative and has been a tireless advocate for the Albany Bowl. And it's going to be a really terrific local exploration of amateur practices. I encourage you to go. So as stated, self-organized student performances will be interspersed in between the panels, and we'll, the day will conclude with a fashion show. Please stay for that. I've been talking about that all year. <laughs> Everybody's come to my events all year. It's like, and there's going to be a student fashion show at the Amateurism Conference. And they've worked really hard for it. Um, and it will be all a surprise to me. I have entirely, they are, it's very self-organized. I did not oversee it whatsoever, so um, it's all going to be new. Uh, very exciting. So to kick things off in an energetic fashion, I'd like to introduce the Wolf Girl Suite, which is a feminist and queer performance that has been headed up by Judy Pinya. Judy graduated last semester with her BFA from the Art Practice Department here at Berkeley, and for her thesis show, works to teach herself and her collaborators a genre they call sculptural drumming that incorporates this handmade structure. This is part of their, this is part of Judy's piece. This is not part of the show. It's been brought in special for this occasion. And Judy's work um, is in dialogue with the many drum circles on this campus, and regardless of how you approach them with your own lens of distinction, or how your own case sorts those uh, activities um, in your own mind, that is to say, whether you walk towards them or walk away from them, they are a very distinctive feature of self-organized arts production here on campus, and you cannot easily not listen to them. And I think, for me, what's really exciting about what Jensen Young and Judy have done is to approach them, uh, the drum circle, from a feminist and queer of color perspective. So please let us welcome the Wolf Girl.